Ja, schönen guten Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich im Namen des Deutschen Filmmuseums begrüßen ähm, zu der Filmvorführung von History Futures von Fiona Tan. Und ich freue mich ganz besonders, dass sie die Zeit gefunden hat, sozusagen so kurz vor ihrer Ausstellungseröffnung im MMK 1 am Freitag noch hier vorbeizukommen, um ähm, den Film vorzustellen. Ähm, die Ausstellung läuft dann bis zum 17. Januar. Ähm, der Film ist ihr erster ähm, abendfüllender ähm, Kinofilm ähm, und hatte in äh, Rotterdam ähm, Anfang des Jahres, ähm, Ende, Ende Januar, seine Premiere gehabt. Ähm, mittlerweile gibt es aber auch schon einen zweiten Film, der dieses Jahr in Locarno ähm, gelaufen ist, Ascent, ähm, der sich auch ähnlich wie ihr erster Film, eine Mischung aus Dokumentarfilm, ähm, Spielfilm, ähm, ähm, eben so sehr zwischen den Medien bewegt, ähm, wie auch ihre Installationen und ähm, eigentlich auch nur aus Fotografien besteht. Ähm, ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich erstmal hier im Kino begrüßen. Herzlich willkommen, Fiona Tan. Und ich möchte ebenso gern äh, herzlich Peter Gorschlüter begrüßen, ähm, mit dem uns jetzt sozusagen schon eine lange ähm, Kooperation verbindet. Es fing an 2013, auch Ende September, ähm, mit dem Buchmessenschwerpunkt, also auch dem Buchmessengastland äh, Brasilien, mit ähm, Helio Oiticica, war die Ausstellung bei euch damals. Und wir haben dazu den Film seines Neffens gezeigt, den er über seinen Vater gedreht hat und der eben auch die Ausstellung ähm, kuratiert hatte. Ähm, das war sozusagen der Beginn und ähm, dann ähm, in diesem Jahr zum Imaginären Museum haben wir eine Reihe gezeigt, letztes Jahr zu Mokudis ähm, und davor zu der göttlichen Komödie. Also es hat jetzt schon so eine schöne Tradition und ähm, ich finde, das passt immer wunderbar sozusagen mit dem Museum und Kino und ich hoffe, dass es so weitergeht. Herzlich willkommen und dann gebe ich jetzt das Wort an dich. Um vielen, vielen Dank. <lacht> Vielen Dank, Natascha. Ich möchte auch gar nicht viele Worte verlieren, nur kurz ankündigen, dass im Anschluss an den Film Fiona Tan hier für Fragen zur Verfügung steht. Ich werde das ein wenig moderieren, vielleicht ein paar Eingangsfragen stellen und dann haben wir aber besprochen, dass wir das recht zügig und bald für, für Fragen aus dem Publikum eröffnen. Und ich glaube, wenn Sie den Film sehen, wenn sich viele Fragen stellen, so hoffe ich sehr auf Ihre Beteiligung. Ich möchte mich äh, an dieser Stelle sehr bedanken bei dir, Natascha, beim Filmmuseum, bei deinem und eurem Team ähm, für diese Kooperation. Wie du gesagt hast, ist schon die x-te Kooperation in den letzten Jahren, die wir gemacht haben. Und dieser Film von Fiona Tan ist eben ihr erster Kinofilm und wirklich für die Präsentation im Kino vorgesehen. Wir hätten das gar nicht zeigen können bei uns im Museum. Insofern sind wir extrem dankbar, dass das hier unter professionellen, cineastischen Bedingungen möglich ist, so kurz vor der Öffnung, die am Freitag ist, zu der ich Sie alle herzlich einlade, 20 Uhr ins MMK1 am Freitag zu kommen. Sie werden sehen, äh, wenn Sie dann die Ausstellung besuchen, äh, in ein paar Tagen oder vielleicht ein paar Wochen, äh, dass dieser Film sehr, sehr viel zu tun hat äh, mit der Ausstellung, es sich sehr viele Parallelitäten, äh, Verbindungslinien ergeben und äh, äh, ich hoffe sehr, dass Sie dann auch die Gelegenheit haben, die Ausstellung zu sehen und vielleicht noch vertiefend in die Thematik und die Motive und auch die Bilder dieses Films einzusteigen. Jetzt wünsche ich uns allen einen anregenden, ein, spann ein spannendes Kinoerlebnis und im Anschluss dann eine fruchtbare Diskussion. Viel Spaß. Ja, nochmal einen schönen guten Abend. Welcome, Fiona Tan. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm probably uh, the only lucky one who has seen this film twice now. <laughs> uh, I say that because um, it's so multi-layered. There's so many elements to it and so many twists, actually, um, that I could see it several more times, maybe um, to understand more of the interconnections between the, these elements that are in. And I think, um, well, Let's try to unpack some of these elements. I don't think we can get to the very bottom tonight in this talk, but uh, maybe a few things. Um, w one thing which is very obvious to me is that you break with a lot of conventions of classical storytelling in cinema, particularly uh, if we compare it to Hollywood films productions or similar productions in the cinema, starting with that there are far too many characters in this film, a lot of people, let's say. There are 
there's probably not a real climax in it. It starts with the end, and it ends with a kind of fairly open ending, at least with no proper conclusion, as we would yeah. probably expect. So it doesn't it. end with the beginning like it should. Yeah. yeah. So there's this. Yeah. Um, I was uh, wondering, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, how the idea for the film evolved and um, what connection you see in terms of storytelling, if that was an obvious decision mm -hmm. to challenge right. these ways of storytelling. Yeah. I mean, um, there's, a, there's a, a lot of things to I could talk about, but one thing I became very interested, I mean, you know, he I created a character who's a sort of a non-create character. He's a Mr. Nobody, and, you know, even Odysseus uh, called himself Mr. Nobody when he was pretending to be a beggar. And um, so I, I, I created a person who could be my vehicle to sort of get us all over the place across Europe. And so he's um, obviously, you know, it's fiction. How come he can cross borders and doesn't have a passport, doesn't have any money? Well, you know, you can do that with film. Um, and uh, I became, so he's searching for to try and understand what's going on and searching for himself is is our search and that becomes quite clear in the film because i'm playing also with uh fiction and documentary um, mixed up together and you have three times in the film that people who real people who are interviewed are answering questions in the film that he asks at the end of the film but i became really interested in this uh, concept of uh, the narrative self And that is that you are who you tell yourself you are. Uh, you have inside your head, we all do, um, this little voice or several voices sort of, you know, saying, oh, no, sit up straight and, uh, you know, um, you look better if you do this and this is your chocolate side and, you know, and, uh, oh, shit, I shouldn't have said that. And, you know, so you have this little, you know, and we all do that. And if you lose that, then you really lose a big part of yourself. And if, if you lose your memory, then you, you lose a huge part of your identity. And that's all very strongly connected. So this idea of narrative became uh, more and more interesting to me. But I'm an artist, so I'm not trained. I'm not trained in drama and in, in, in how you're supposed to tell a story. So I'm, I'm coming at it from a very strange angle. And, um, yeah, I suppose I'm also coming at it visually. So, um, I mean, I was told uh, <laughs> it, 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 it does have quite a classical uh, literary structure because it's a, a, a picturesque story. So it's a story with episodes, which is like the Pinocchio story also. So, I mean, you know, it's not that strange <laughs> what I'm doing. It's just maybe not so typical ho Hollywood, but I didn't want to do that anyhow, because Hollywood can do that, you know. Um, I think the, you know, we're speaking about losing the memory that MP, the missing person, does, and um, what it means to a person to kind of lose its identity. But sometimes I feel that it's actually, it seems quite a relief for this person, but he, he seems to by losing his kind of own memory, he seems to better understand the world that he s surrounds us. Is that maybe, maybe not. I mean, in some ways he's become quite childlike and, you know, I think that's great because then you're very open just to experiencing what's around you and, and taking it without being um, prejudiced or having um, preconceived ideas. On the other hand, he, he seems to be sort of bumping into people and they're telling him who he is. Or, and at a certain point in the film, he starts sort of turning that around a little bit and playing with who he might be. Um, but, you know, right at the end of the film, there's a taxi driver, um, which I thought was quite fitting, um, who sort of says, oh, I know who you are. And you sort of like, you know, okay, great. You know, finally, he's going to find who he is. And he says, he says something that he doesn't want to hear, and yes, uh, yeah. which is maybe well mm -hmm. not true anyway. So. Particularly the ending leaves me uh, a little unsettled or uncanny because I wouldn't really be able to say whether it's uh, MP who has finally found an identity, seeing Snow, Mr. Snow, and maybe he kind of appropriates this identity or hijacks this identity and finally has kind of come, you know, to 
a name or kind of to go or if it's actually the taxi driver who's the kind of the puppet maker who kind of plays with him yeah can yeah. you help me <laughs> no <laughs> i don't want to because i that i mean that's maybe the the tricky thing because i was uh you know uh thinking about where we are in europe now mm -hmm. and obviously it would be the nicest thing on earth if if there was something or someone who could say what we're supposed to do and where we're supposed to go and how we're supposed to live our lives and what the future is going to be like but that doesn't exist so i have to tell a story which is not going to have a clear ending i felt and that's actually sort of like something you're not supposed to do in cinema so how do you do that you know Another important aspect of all of your work, but particularly in this film as well, is uh, time. When we talked about uh, during the install yesterday or the other day, you say we are interested interested in sculpting time. I guess that means kind of using time as a material that you can be formed, extended, condensed, and I think uh, all of that happens in this film. So you're never quite sure exactly whether in which time you are in. Is it the real time, is it the past, is it a potential future? And while I was watching the film today, I noticed there's no real telling of uh, which year the action is set in. There's only one little reference at the end. The driver, uh, taxi driver's license says <laughs> it expires 2017. Uh, but uh, anyway, I mean, what is very obvious in the film is that there, is, uh, there are many references to recent events like global political events, crisis demonstrations, uh, Costa Concordia, and so on and so on. And um, I was wondering what was for you the kind of what drove you to include all this, I think it's partly found footage, right, uh, into this film and kind of interweaving it with, with your fiction. Um, it was something I wanted from the start. I wanted to uh, have uh, documentary and fiction uh, um, intercut and um, flowing from one to the other and I also wanted it to be not so clear um, when when it's fiction and when it's documentary and actually a lot of the fictional scenes are, are shot in uh, in real situations so like when he's in the bar drunk dancing all on his own um, actually, they were just real people. It was a real bar. It was two o'clock at night in Barcelona, you know. So, um, um, but I, I, I wanted this deliberate sort of unclarity. Um, I don't know that I can say why, except that it really interests me. This where, where is where is something real and where is something not real, and where is something staged and where is something not staged. And for me, I felt like some of the real material uh, was like so amazing um, that it's much more impressive than anything you you could film for a, a fictionally. I mean, you know, like the cars on the ship or whatever. Um, and so it's it's sort of always reaching into reality, if you like. Um, and for him, it's very unclear where where is something real and where is he just making it up. Um, so for him, life is one huge Bosch painting, I think. As you mentioned the painting, I think there are quite a lot of um, references to painting. We hit the final shot, basically. We can see that before, if you notice the, the postcard, I think it's a painting by Jericho. Uh, the kleptoman or kleptomaniac, the kleptomaniac, yeah. kleptomaniac but there are different other uh, kind of uh, reference to painting can you talk about this a little bit how come that you know you're so influenced by it and um yeah i, I guess it's just because you know i studied art and i i like painting and i like to look at paintings and it all came out it, it wasn't sort of intentional but it was funny when I was in the final stage of editing, I showed the film to someone and he said, uh, oh, why have you, you know, that's so clear you're putting all these paintings in there. And I hadn't even really realized it. But for me, it was just, for me, they were very, very strong images and I really wanted to use them. I mean, you know, this, this portrait of the kleptomaniac is for me such a, 
really strong and very contemporary image of, of, a, of a man confused and a man lost. And then I found it actually very fitting that he was supposed to be a kleptomaniac uh, because my character is someone who's sort of taking things all the time and taking personalities or taking possible identities. Um, and uh, I think in some ways we're all kind of doing that. So. Um, uh, yeah, I I don't know. I think these things just come out without you realizing it. So, you know, I'm very visually orientated, so it just um, was waiting in my memory for it to come out. Speaking about art, um, of course, you're a very well-known uh, visual artist, and uh, this now has been your first uh, feature film, your first movie for the cinema. Um, I can see a lot of connections to to video installations you did previously or you've been doing during the last years. Um, but I would be interested um, what were the differences for you or maybe the similarities uh, compared to your work as a, an artist, let's say. Of course, you're one and the same person. I don't want to pretend it's completely different things, but obviously there, has, there must have been a decision why you would want to make a movie. Um, yeah, I was interested in the experiment and um, uh, I was also interested in, in I, I feel I'm coming more from documentary, you know, as, a, as an artist and someone working with cameras and with moving image. Uh, I've always felt much more close to, to documentary film. Um, but I became in increasingly, also in, in my artworks, I became sort of increasingly interested in sort of staging things and working with actors and very carefully controlling the light or... Uh, the setting um, and um, then I became interested in this idea of you know actually really writing a proper script uh, which I did for this film and um, that was like really quite fun you know you can s you can dream up anything at all and write it down and then if you're lucky you get a little bit of money and then you have someone who says okay you have written here a forest of palm trees so uh, how many palm trees do you want and what color and how high should they be you know and you go like ah oh, geez um well let's do 24 and then <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like fantastic because you can just dream something and then you can make it real if you're lucky and then obviously at some stage you always have to compromise and then you have to fight and you know you have to deal with a lot of people and a lot of responsibility um and it's a, it's a it's a very long run it's it's a marathon so there were you know at least two or three times where i almost gave it up i really thought uh, this is costing me too much of my life and it's just too hard but then someone I was working with on the film would pull me through and um, yeah, we got there in the end. And apparently it's something you would like to continue. We just heard an introduction that there's a new feature film that has just been kind of released. Yeah, I have made a second film, but it's in some ways even more experimental than this one and it was made with even less money. So, and I produced it all on my own. So I had, I took back the freedom that I had as an artist, I've taken back again. And now, I'm not really sure, well, I'll see. I'm not quite sure whether I'm going to um, do another movie or not. Uh, I suppose it's a bit stupid not to make another one because it's kind of like, you know, you're just starting to open some doors there. And But I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll see. Maybe that's a good point to open up the discussion to the audience. Um. I, I should say I'm being very lazy this evening. Ich spreche nämlich Deutsch. <laughs> also, das heißt, Sie können mir auf Deutsch eine Frage stellen. Und wenn es nicht zu so schwierig ist, dann probiere ich es auch auf Deutsch zu antworten. <laughs> Any. Ja, Katharina? Can you take the microphone, oh. please? Uh, in the scene where he tries to um, kill himself in the bath bathroom, um, he imagines trying to kill himself three times. Yeah, um, you made up a reference to um, the painting by the death of Marat, and in this painting, there's a, a letter 
that is uh, the key to the interpretation of the painting. So I was wondering, uh, what is the book, uh, f who's, um, who's the author of the book that lies on the toilet in your film? Uh, it was an important book because it was about psychoanalysis, but it, I'm sorry, I can't remember anymore. It had a great cover, but I hadn't read the book myself. But in, in all the other other books in the film, they're now in the exhibition. Okay. <laughs> I just noticed it tonight. <laughs> there are many things you will uh, recognize when you visit the exhibition. For instance, the train model, which features several times, the roller shutter constructions of these kind of storage units. Uh, yeah, and even I, I noticed uh, the map of the world, which is yeah, in the exhibition. Lots of so things. lots of physical elements, and of course, lots of uh, kind of motives um, and themes that uh, will come up. So you will have a kind of déjà vu, but uh, it's a probably a test of memory as well. Are there more questions? Well, there's, there's one more question I would uh, like to ask, and I know it's already late, so we don't keep the discussion going on for hours. A very um, obvious thing in the film is uh, the use of the various languages. So there must have been a conscious decision not to have the whole movie in, in English or Dutch or whatever language, but any place uh, the film is set in, has its original language. Can you talk about this decision a bit? Um, yeah. Um, well, it's something I really love about Europe, that that uh, there are so many countries and so many languages and so many cultures so close together. So, um, and I, I'm lucky as an artist, I get to travel a lot. So, I, um, you know, a lot of the location scouting I, I sort of did by accident because it was places where I was uh, for, for my work. And um, so when I was developing the film and it was sort of this kaleidoscope, so I want him to be going all over, traveling all over the place. Um, then I, I also wanted him to be like I would love to be able to be, but I can't, um, that he can understand everything. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just had him um, able, able to speak uh, German and French and... Um, and he couldn't, so we had to practice very hard. But uh, yeah, and um, <laughs> with German, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, his French was also a bit scratchy, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's kind of a, a, you know, he falls into scenes and he falls into different countries, and he, you know, he can walk out of one country, and in the next shot, he walks into another, or he's walking. Um, you know, walking actually in something in his mind and then he walks into the airport in Paris or, you know, that was something that I very consciously wanted to sort of jumble up sort of the impossible geography, if you like. Maybe, oh, Adrian? Adrian? Oh, thank you for the marathon film. It was great. Um, I had more of a comment, I guess. Uh, that I really liked the the fact that his countrylessness and not orienting him to a place or a language, um, it really felt like, in a way, as an adult, uh, you have a, a newborn that he's without any history, he's starting fresh, and it kind of gave me this feeling that maybe if. I mean, of course, we're always trying to remember history so we don't repeat it, but it was this kind of message it felt a little bit like if we could just concentrate on the present, then we could figure out where we are. But the film also left me with a total disoriented sense, as if I was just under hypnosis or something. So it did that, it had that nice function of uh, bringing us to this lost state could really relate to the character. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions in the audience? So maybe to conclude, last question. Um, of course, the, the beginning is, uh, you can see, we can see a cinema auditorium, and it's kind of moving. Um, what should I say backwards? backwards yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And there, and there, uh, 
at different moments in the film you see different kind of auditoriums it's always kind of well, they're always cinemas uh, and yeah. i mean it's sort of a current theme there are several you know it's actually struck myself how carefully constructed the film is actually um um i should when the dvd comes out i should do you know the director explaining everything <laughs> um um, it's a recurring theme in the film cinemas, and it's actually the only place where he can sleep. Um, he falls asleep in the cinema, which was my tongue-in-cheek joke. And also, um, you know, it's a, a mirror shot. The very first shot, and it's nice because this is a red cinema this evening. The very first shot in the scene in the, in the film is is a huge uh, cinema. It's the largest cinema in Ireland, actually, um, and it's empty. Uh, which was me sort of thinking about, well, what is the future of cinema, actually? So, um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's also quite handy because it's a sort of a, an, another um, way of um, starting afresh. So he, he, you know, he ran away from Caroline in Paris into a cinema and um, then he can sort of extract himself from that difficult situation so for him life is one dream or one film I, you know I think and it's been written about a lot and spoken about a lot um, dream and cinema are very strongly related and um, I'm very interested in how memory visual memory and cinema uh, and editing are, are connected um, so I was I was sort of exploring that in, in the film too I think this is a real Nice statement to conclude our short conversation. Okay, thank you. Homage to yeah. the cinema. Um, thank you for being here, and um, we hope to see you all again at the MMK uh, either on Friday or during the next weeks and months. Thank you very much, Fiona, for thank being you, here for this Peter, talk. Thank you, and thank you, Natasha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you for being here, both of you. <laughs>